Greetings, stranger. I am pleased to see you made it after all. I trust you have been able to enjoy the sights and cultures of Atari. You did not lose too much sleep from last night's stories of deep-sea monsters and undead spirits, I hope. This is most agreeable, as is our weather today, which I am pleased to find warm and sunny, with a light breeze that is perfect for touring. I have prepared everything here, and we are ready to begin our journey westwards towards Diabel. Hop back onto the carriage, and we will depart at once. Our route today takes us in almost a direct line, piercing through the final miles of the Immenwood and into the southwestern section of Kortos. We are heading into the part of the island that does not have an official name, demarcated to the north by the critical Deluge River and to the south by the shoreline. I personally consider it part of the Kortos Consortium's territory, because it is in practice overseen by its agents and officials. I know that I have mentioned the Consortium fleetingly many times now, and I promise to give you a full explanation when we reach Diabel. But in the meantime, if I might crave your indulgence while we sojourn together, I would like to tell you about another creature that is documented in the mighty Encyclopaedia Galadianensis. I know, I know, I have been mentioning it a lot recently, but the old tome saved my life on more than one occasion, and I am sure that its pages will continue to offer truth and wisdom to you as you adventure around Galarian. Given that our destination is another port, I thought it would be suitable to introduce you to the Witches of the Sea, more commonly called Sea Hags. In fact, it is about time that we brought you up to speed with the basics of hags in general, because they can be found stalking almost every society and settlement if they are not identified and rooted out. Unfortunately, this happens all too rarely, for there are still many misconceptions about these creatures, though these plague confrontations with sea hags less frequently, so they serve as an acceptable introduction to their kind. The sea hags of Kortos are seldom seen out of salt water, let alone in land, so rest assured that you are safe from their meddling between here and Diabel. However, once we reach the port, be sure not to stray too close to the water, especially after dark. There are more than ruined ships in the mouth of the harbour. There is actually very little that we can say about hags as a collective. More than any other creature family, hags occupy distinct niches and carve out unique roles for themselves and for the societies they stalk. I would even go so far as to say that even the incredible complexity of the dragons pales in comparison to the diversity of hags, despite them being an entirely female race. Much of this stems from the fact that very little is understood about their fundamental nature and origins. Common folk wisdom recalls stories of beautiful women being cursed, either through malice or hubris, into twisted forms with evil minds. The most popular variation threads a plot of a sisterhood trio dwelling in the First World, who were exiled by the Seelie or Unseely Fae as punishment for the wounds inflicted onto nature's beauty following their disfigurations. Their journey into the material plane contorted them yet further until they dragged themselves into existence as the first Anis, Green, and Sea Hags. Yet as with much common wisdom, it seems to me pursuing practical caution in favour of sincere scholarly authority. Most obviously, this tale and others like it neglect to explain how the other hag kinds emerged, and they offer no comment as to why the hags are not fey creatures if they originate from that plane. Luckily for you and me, we have access to the Encyclopaedia Galarianensis, which clarifies that most hags are in fact a kind of monstrous humanoid like uh, centaurs and minotaurs, although some seem to be most comfortable in the outer plains beyond the Astral Sea, and so can also be considered outsiders. That said, hags can currently occupy their own creature family that overlaps with these more general labels, and this ought to arouse suspicion for the biologist and the pneumatologist within you. Once we further acknowledge that different hag heritages are inclined to pursue different affairs and to follow unrelated ambitions, some have begun to question whether they should be considered related creatures at all. There are even some who believe that hags are better described as events, something akin to avalanches and lightning storms, albeit much more sinister. Now, at first, this comparison seems absurd. You cannot negotiate with a tornado or battle a tsunami. And yet, 
there is certainly something to be said about the perspective of hags being the result of cruel emotions injected into an entropic, magic world. All I can say for certain is that hags are always female presenting members of roughly humanoid races, mostly humans, if possible. All of them rely on the males of other ancestries to reproduce, and their offspring, called changelings, are usually left to be raised independent of their influence until they reach maturity. At this time, hags congregate in magic augmenting unions called covens to perform a sort of coming-of-age ritual on behalf of their children. This ritual is called the calling, and it is felt by the changeling offspring as a psychic compulsion to wander towards their mothers. Curiously, changelings can reject the summons, and thereby live the rest of their lives in the footsteps of their father's ancestries. However, those who accept the call are subjected to a painful metamorphosis by the responsible hag coven, from which will emerge the new hag, utterly devoid of any previous attachments or cares. Because only female changelings can undertake this metamorphosis, any males who answer the call are simply killed, which is a testament to the overwhelming power of this instinct. Of course, this is also the dark reason for the remarkable gender imbalance amongst changelings in our societies. Andracide is a common practice for hags. So, what about the sea hags? Well, they differ from their cousins in a number of ways, although these fundamentals still hold true. The sea witches, as they are quite inaccurately sometimes also known, are regarded as the weakest in the hag family, and despite this nickname, they are not particularly skilled in the practice of magic. A typical sea hag stands between five and six feet tall, and presents a skinny, almost emaciated frame. Their long limbs end in webbed digits that are themselves equipped with vicious claws, normally clogged with silt, mud and putrid flesh from previous kills. Close inspection of a sea hag's form betrays its femininity, but they are often more androgynous than their other kin, simply by virtue of being so hideously repulsive that gender is the last thing to cross anyone's mind. Their faces are oddly flat, taut with sickly green skin that covers a wide mouth stuffed with teeth. Superficially, the head would resemble an Absalomian newspaper's caricature of a goblin's if it weren't for the horizontal ears and seaweed-like hair that clings to the fetid scalp. The overall appearance of a sea hag is so horrific that some older specimens exude a supernatural aura of decay. Those who lock gazes with such hags need strong constitutions to withstand the enfeebling effect emitted by these creatures. Despite looking as though they have not fed in weeks, sea hags indeed, hags in general, are wickedly strong, even more so than your average centaur. Just imagine an eight-foot-tall horse-human hybrid with rippling muscles losing an arm-wrestling match with a starved grandmother to understand how deceptive their looks can be. In fact, they outclass your average humanoid in every way except one. They are vulnerable to cold iron, the material that burns demons and fey alike. This is a curious weakness that has long fascinated scholars and been the cause of much debate and has brought comparable relief to many brave adventurers caught up in a hag's machinations. Ecologically, although sea hags live up to their name by making their dwellings underwater, typically along coastlines, they are completely amphibious and more than capable of confronting a creature on the land. Let me remind you at this point that these are the weakest of hag specimens. Now, all sea hags possess two supernatural abilities of which the intrepid wreckage diver or sea cave explorer should be keenly aware. The first is hidden in their sight and is often called their evil eye or dreadful gaze. Being beheld by a sea hag is enough to trigger a terrible fear and sense of impending doom within a victim. If sustained for long enough, this glare can induce a catatonic, comatose state in a victim for days on end. While unconscious, the poor soul is beset by terrible nightmares that have been known to trigger heart failure in even the most robust of adventurers. Sea hags use this power for two purposes. The first is hunting, for which this visual weapon is even more effective than those of the cockatrices or basilisks of Galarian, as this gaze does not need to be reciprocated to be effective. Blocking your own vision will do nothing to protect yourself from this evil eye. Many victims never even realize what is panicking them until it is too late. 
The second purpose of this power is reproduction. Unlike most of their fellow hags, sea witches are unable to polymorph themselves into attractive women. They remain permanently husk-like. Consequently, sea hags without a coven granting them access to superior magic who wish to reproduce will seek male victims to assault whilst they are unconscious and subdued by their dreadful gaze. The second supernatural ability possessed by all sea hags is the capacity to form devilish pacts with others. To my mind, this is the power that elevates the creatures into being true hags, for these bargains do not bring any benefit to them except for the suffering they inflict upon others. Every breed of hag revels in a particular flavour of emotional torment, and for the sea hags this manifests as the desire to rob the privileged of their assets. I do not mean in the sense of repossessing property or redistributing wealth and fortunes, but rather I speak of the fundamental qualities of a person that distinguish them from others. A singer will be left voiceless, a questing knight will be rendered cowardly, and so forth. In exchange for these qualities, sea hags can grant boons that twist fate in a supplicant's favour, though most often they are simply granted permission to leave a hag's territory physically unharmed. Once concluded, a pact cannot be voided unless the sea hag goes back on her word or is slain, and it is an unusually powerful ability, even for a hag. Due to their amphibious nature and guarded intelligence, killing a sea hag is never a straightforward endeavour. Bounties are often placed on their heads by those who have been extorted by them for their privileges, who return to civilization unable to earn income or enjoy their lives. However, even with this financial incentive, the wise adventurer accepts the task only when they are certain of success, because an array of fates worse than death await the failed bounty hunter. Sea hags are swift in water, and their lairs are usually located beneath the ocean's waves, so the first priority should always be to facilitate a terrestrial battle if possible. Make no mistake, a sea hag on dry land remains a dangerous foe, but once robbed of their preferred environment's protection and concealment, they are unlikely to pose a great threat to a well-equipped party. The most dangerous weapon is, of course, their evil eye, but this power cannot affect multiple people simultaneously, and it takes time to mature in strength. Therefore, even a duo of hunters stands an exponentially greater chance of success than the lone wolf. More so than my previous monster discussions, I advise confronting sea hags in groups. Be sure that you all wield weapons forged from cold iron as well. Now, the most pressing concern of any sea hack hunter is whether or not their quarry is operating solo or as part of a coven. I am sorry to have to report that sea hags are more likely than many of their kin to cooperate with one another. Their pacts can even approach the adjectives sisterly and amicable, in sharp contrast to the business-like disposition of most hack covens. Unfortunately, this will make it rather difficult to set the members against each other. Remember also that covens always number at least three members, but that there is no upper limit to how many hags may have committed themselves to its rituals. Each hag in a coven will be stronger than usual, and most notably for the sea hags, they will gain the ability to cast spells and curses. Sea hag covens are particularly fond of casting the so-called Mariner's Curse, which essentially inflicts semi-permanent seasickness onto a creature regardless of their location or affinity for the water. I advise you well, reconsider fighting any hag coven, even a trio of their weakest members. This advice is redoubled if you feel the need to enter the water. Only under the most trivial or dire of circumstances should you venture to do so, for your disadvantages beneath the waves are numerous. Weapons are slower and less effective, vision is greatly reduced, body heat dissipates more rapidly, and the crushing pressure of the depths menaces any encounter. Even though a sea hag's lair is likely to be very close to the shoreline, to the point that it might even be above the water in some cave or hidden coastal nook, this does not do much to mitigate the dangers of going swimming with a sea hag. My advice would be to stock up on magic items that enable water breathing and negate as many of these disadvantages as possible, or to subcontract out your reasons for entering the water to an individual who is as equally amphibious as your quarry. Only then do you stand a chance of emerging from the ordeal alive. Well, stranger, 
There is an introduction to the weird world of hags. I hope this advice has been well received come nightfall around Diabell's shorelines. I cannot advise you strongly enough not to go on any midnight fishing trips or beach strolls. As we say in my hometown, to wander without wish is to walk without wisdom. I urge you to bear that in mind after the Diabell tour. For now, though, you are safe from sea hags under the shade of the Immenwood trees. I can see in your face that burning question. Yes, there are plenty of other, more dangerous hags who could be lurking around here, but I doubt it. They prefer the decayed areas of the world, and the Atari woods have thrived in the past couple of years. So relax, enjoy the birdsong and sunlight, and I will disturb you next when we reach the second largest settlement on the Isle of Kortos. Well, until then. <laughs>